And Zach is the managing editor uh, at Coindesk, and we're excited to have you guys here today. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. We're He's thrilled to be here. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're thrilled. Um, we're, we're kicking off the morning right talking enterprise, enterprise blockchain, which is the sexiest, the sexiest of topics on the agenda today. Um, I'm told that enterprise blockchain is exciting, though. Is that right? Catherine? It's blockchain for the real world. Hey, that's a tweetable little nugget you can start your day off right with. Um, first of all, before we get going, I want to just sort of uh, navigate you for a second. IBM is a giant company. It's called Big Blue for a reason. Um, we've heard your title. What does that mean? What does it mean that you do on a daily basis? So my job is to think about what is happening in the market, in the technology market around the world. How does blockchain play a role in that? What is the opportunity for IBM to build a product and make some money in that space? And then how do I actually define that product? How do I build that product? And then how do I sell and implement that product out in the market? So what I do is stitch together our incredibly talented engineers and researchers, um, our marketing, our sales, and then our finance team to actually define a product, build it, and then sell it in the market. It's basically like running a small startup within a really large organization. Got it. So you're actually building out the stack that's being deployed elsewhere in the world. Exactly. Okay, fantastic. So uh, we have one slide, and it's someone else's slide. Is there a type person on the slides? We don't even need the slide. That's how basic our slide is. But maybe you've seen this slide. It's a tweet, and it says, simple flowchart. And it's a riff on some of the flowcharts in the industry. And the thing on the top of it says, do I need a blockchain? And there's one line, and it goes to a box that says no. I guess a big part of uh, your work is convincing people in the enterprise space that that's not correct, that's not the correct viewpoint. What's your take on this uh, overly simplistic uh, viewpoint? Well, so I'd start by asking you a few questions back. There you go. Right? So do you have, do you transact with multiple different organizations? Are there rules that govern whether you're transacting an asset or not? Is it hard to keep track of where the assets are? Who paid who? Has the product been delivered, etc.? If you're dealing with any of those problems and the members of those different organizations want to retain control of their data, their assets, and their information, then you might absolutely be primed for a blockchain. But if I were the devil's advocate here, I would say there are other technical solutions that may be more efficient, uh, potentially less costly in times of IT spend. Uh, why wouldn't I just go with a, a, a regular database? Uh, and why, why, why are you selling me on the blockchain idea? So a lot of, so, so you're absolutely right. And we spend as much time telling clients not to use blockchain as to use blockchain. Because we want to make sure that it's actually a good use case and that it makes sense for, for our clients. But where we see uh, blockchain making the most sense is when there's kind of one of four things that they're looking for. They need to get consensus across a number of different organizations, but those organizations don't want to centralize or give a single administrator or a single party control over the data. Um, when they want transactions to be tamper-proof or immutable, they want there to be no way for someone to come in and change a transaction. They want to have a record of every single thing that happens on that ledger in that set of books. Um, when they're looking for finality, when they want to make sure that when transactions happen, they are actually clear, final, and settled. And then finally, if they're looking for provenance, and so really being able to track throughout an entire ecosystem, a supply chain, et cetera, how an asset is moving. Those are the use cases where I tend to see the, really the strongest opportunity for blockchain. Um, I think that's really where we see clients kind of ready to move forward. If reconciliation is an issue, blockchain is normally something that, that makes sense to look at. Okay, so those are the four sort of ideas, that's, those are the four pillars of, or the, uh, the four foundations of this house. Uh, you know, put, put some meat on these bones. Give me some concrete examples of things that are working here in 2019. How many folks are you working with? How many folks are production grade? Uh, what are some of those concrete examples of places that, uh, that blockchains are working? 
Yeah, absolutely. So across the IBM Corporation, we have over 2,000 people that are working on blockchain. Um, at IBM, we are working end to end across blockchain. So um, we are. So my role is at the technology and the product level. We are building the stack. So we're contributing to Hyperledger Fabric and the open source because we think that being truly open, openly governed, open source is critical. And the Linux Foundation is the organization that has done this for 25 years that actually knows how to run open source better than anybody else on the planet. So, so that's first. Um, and then we've built, obviously, a, a platform to make it easy to use that open source code. But then there's also industry solutions. So we are working in supply chain with IBM Food Trust, trying to make the, the food supply chain much more straightforward, working with trade lens around global shipping, and then WorldWire around uh, cross-border payments. We also are working with an ecosystem of probably 500 or more different startups, companies, governments, NGOs, all types of organizations that see opportunity to use blockchain to transform their industries. And our consulting arm, it has many, many, many consultants that are working from, I have an idea, is block, does blockchain make sense, to holy cow, I have a production network. We are actually going to be transacting, exchanging assets from my company to another. And that is, you know, we really have that, that whole gamut. IBM saw this back in really 2014, even earlier than that. We were talking about this in our global technology outlook. And what's cool about when you work at a big company is you've got incredible researchers who are looking at it from a technology perspective, a business perspective, and we've been able to tap into that really early. Gotcha. I want to talk about Trade Lens specifically. That's the, uh, it's the IBM Maersk spin out, the supply chain stuff. I know my colleague Ian Allison back in October did some reporting that there had been some adoption challenges there, right? It was, it was hard to convince other carriers in the shipping industry that they should team up with a rival and build this blockchain system that potentially would provide some real efficiencies. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to sort of update that story and use that as maybe um, you know, a, a, a pain point uh, that we can unpack a little bit in terms of understanding how and why we get big enterprises to embrace this uh, and adopt the benefits that exist with this technology. Well, so, so I think the first and most important thing I would say is that blockchain is much less a technology innovation and it's much more an economic and a governance innovation. It allows organizations that, you know, as humans, like, let's, let's get out of the technology, let's, let's go with what's real. Like, human, as humans, we don't necessarily play nicely with others. It's not something that large organizations small organizations necessarily do. And throughout history, we have created organizations that provide that trust, that provide governance, that sit in the center. And what blockchain technology allows us to do is to begin to automate that, to use a, a trustless system, to use math, to use technology to achieve similar levels of trust. Um, and so, you know, I think this isn't, you know, uh, Trade Lens is a, is a great example. We started uh, with Maersk, but very quickly working to open it up to many, many different types of organizations, global customs unions, um, trucking companies, other shippers. What's really important to transform these industries is to actually have many of the different ecosystem players that are part of that. And where our, you know, our philosophy is that you need to, in the real world, you want to know who you're transacting with, right? You want to know where your shipment is coming from. That customs agent wants to know that it's actually flowers from Kenya in the, in the container and not illicit substances, you know? Um, and so what we're trying to do, but not everybody needs to know exactly what those, that those are flowers or how much they cost or where exactly they came from. So you want to know who you're transacting with, but you actually want the contents of that transaction to be private. If you buy a house, you might, you might you want to know who you're buying it from, but you might not want everyone to know where it is. So, um, and one of the things that's really important to us is building those really broad ecosystems. We're working with dozens of startups, small and medium enterprises, governments. Um, 
what's really exciting is how this is not just happening in the US or in Europe, it's all over the world. So um, I was in Singapore about a month ago and you know, this is just absolutely taking off. There's a small company called Invictus, which is building um, a small and medium business lending platform for companies that do a lot of import export to help them get credit um, where it might not be available from the traditional tier one banks, right? And they, they are companies like that that are seeing opportunities. Singapore is also looking at a digital paperless trade platform and pulling together all of the pieces. That's something that's happening in the Singapore ecosystem that hopefully eventually will be part of Trade Lens and others. Um, in the Middle East, we, the, you've got uh, the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority and the UAE Central Bank are actually working to be the first um, government issued central bank digital currency that they will then use for cross-border payment settlement. So there are lots of different actors, lots of different parties that see the potential and that are trying to make this real um, within the regulatory environments, within the constraints of, of doing business. Um, in Europe, we've got WeTrade, which was started by about a dozen different major European banks, similarly around trade finance. And they are now looking at how do they connect and expand to some of the trade finance networks that are coming out of Hong Kong and other geos. So um, I, think, I think there is really incredible um, businesses that are evolving that see blockchain as a way to enable connection of parties that had a very difficult time transacting, exchanging, trading, et cetera, in the past. So I'm sort of hearing that the pitch to big businesses is like, okay, here's the technology that's sort of trustless by definition, right? These public blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, they exist, we're just publicly disclosing information. Your, your pitch to these big companies is, hey, we can build a little bit of trust into this system by making a permission blockchain, therefore it's something that's going to be of value to you. Is that the thing that resonates with folks or is there some, uh, some other thing I'm not hearing that is really um, closing these deals out in the world? So I think a couple of key things. I think one... The, the ability to really trace how an asset moves through a, an ecosystem is one of the things that's really, really paramount for the customers and the, and, the, and the companies, the organizations, the government. Because essentially when the internet came along, kind of digitized all of these paper processes. And we didn't, nobody took a step back to think about, is this really the best way to do it? And so there's a lot of redundant processes that are left over from, you know, kind of post-World War II, when we really started to get into global commerce in a totally new way, but it was paper-based. In the 70s and 80s, it was faxes. And they kind of put all of that on the internet, not necessarily thinking about, actually, how do we reimagine some of these business processes? Do we need all of these um, intermediaries, all of these channels, et cetera? and reducing time and cost for reconciliation is huge. The second thing I would see is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of startup companies that see inefficiency and that see huge new opportunities for revenue. They see, wait a second, this isn't highly, like this isn't very efficient, this can be done much better, much faster, especially in industries where you might have kind of a tier one set of players, whether it be banks, whether it be shipping. The tier two players have a lot to, to a lot to gain if they're able to get more access to customers, if they're able to expand into new markets. So there's a huge revenue play for them. Um, and then finally, there's a defensive position, especially in financial services. You have a lot of the major tier one companies, banks, etc that look at what um, certainly digital currency promises to do and could potentially completely upend their role in capital markets and foreign exchange and in a whole bunch of different areas. And so you know, they have a lot of these relationships already in place and, and they want to take advantage of that. Um, but the thing for almost every company is that they're regulated to some extent. They have to follow they have to follow global regulations, right? Um, 
even I, I would challenge anyone to tell me a rule, tell, find me a company that doesn't have some regulatory environment it has to deal with, whether it be tax, whether it be you know HR, whether it be actual industry standards like you know the SEC, CFTC, et cetera, and financial services, um, the FDA and the food supply chain. And these companies need to be able to show their regulators that they're doing all the right things. And that is important that they know who they're transacting with and they can actually show all of the assets and the transactions that are happening. Got it. So I feel like, you know, as we move into 2019, there's a, there's a clear awareness of where blockchain works and where it doesn't. I guess my question, are there any unexpected areas that you're excited about using this uh, set of solutions? Uh, in? Is there, is there like, give me something unexpected. I wouldn't expect a blockchain to be useful in this, in this scenario. Uh, I think we think of supply chain, some of those obvious ones. What are some of those uh, more fringe use cases that are actually seeing some traction? So some of the things that I love are how emerging markets are taking blockchain and trying to, and, and trying to solve problems that uh, probably you and I don't even consider. So there's a company called Plastic Bank. And they're trying to solve two major human and, and environmental issues. One is plastic in the ocean, and the other is extreme poverty. So um, we basically dump about a garbage truck worth of plastic into the oceans every hour, which is crazy. And about 80% of that plastic comes from places where there's extreme levels of poverty. So people are trying to really get the foundational elements of like food, housing, you know, basic, basic survival needs met. If you're in Maslow's hierarchy, we are, you know, at the bottom here, just since we've got our students here. Um, and what they've done is they have created an ecosystem. They have created a, um, a blockchain-based uh, token and ecosystem that allows um, individuals to collect plastic and to turn it in and they are paid in basically the plastic bank token. With that token, they can then buy food, cooking gas, school supplies, any sort of like very foundational needs at a series of plastic bank stores. So these people now have a totally new source of income. They are getting plastic out of fields, waterways, rivers, creeks, which eventually end up in the ocean. They are getting access to supplies, and there's a, a really incredible circular economy that starts to build out um, around this. And they didn't have to have a bank to provide the funding to do this. They didn't have to have um, any sort of intermediary. They were able to provide kind of the foundation to do this and start to build these stores. That's when I'm like really excited. And if they can do that, um, you know, across several dozen countries and start to scale that, think about what you can do in, in the broader economy. So. so there's a bunch of cool things that are happening in blockchain right now. I definitely wanted to pivot a little bit. I know we, we both sort of looked up in the stands to see how many students were in the room when the hands went up. So I definitely want to pivot to sort of like tra career trajectory stuff. Yeah. Maybe using you, you as an example. You've been with IBM for a number of years before you got the blockchain bug. Yep. Um, talk to me about uh, just you know quickly. We have about five minutes, and we would like to get a couple questions in if anybody has them. So start thinking. Start thinking. Um, talk to me about your journey within IBM to the blockchain role that you're in now, um, and talk to me about some of the other needs you think that the industry needs, you know, writ large in terms of talent uh, and what um, you know where where we could get some more people to get into this ecosystem. Yeah. So. I think the first thing that to, to keep in mind is the blockchain and the Bitcoin world has a little bit of a, a, a stigma around it, the Bitcoin bros, that you have to be incredibly techy, you've got to be some sort of crypto anarchist to be in this world. And I'm probably the perfect example of someone that doesn't fit into those kind of boxes. Um, I joined IBM out of Wharton because I had been in financial services, worked through the global financial crisis, and looked around and said, technology is going to take most of these jobs. I need to understand the technology side of the house. Um, I was really interested in B2B businesses, and I wanted to be in New York. So IBM had an incredible executive training program, so that was a great reason for me to join IBM. I spent two years in consulting. Um, working with 
with ban with banks, insurance companies, and um, uh, healthcare companies on a whole bunch of different things around you know some some things that sound really boring like accounts payable. How do companies actually pay their suppliers, etc.? But I started to understand how complicated it was to actually make this global economy work. Um, then I went to Istanbul because why not? Um, being a water student, I love living in international places. And I was doing payments modernization um, with the Turkish banks when I found Bitcoin and um, got really excited about the potential. I think I shared the story in my keynote last year. Um, and I found these pockets at IBM where people were doing research and trying to build things. At the time, it was with Ethereum. And I got really excited and started talking to central banks and all of my customers in Turkey and South Africa and UAE about this. So this is 2014, 2015, so it's still really early. And in 2015, I kind of met the core developers that were starting to build a product within IBM. And I said, I know financial services. I don't want to just sell this. I don't want to just evangelize. I actually want to build this business. And so I moved back to the US in 2016 and have been running the team since 2017. And what I think is really cool about blockchain is that it's not just about the technology. This space needs designers, it needs lawyers, it needs business people. It needs creative people to actually bring this to the real world. I think one of the things that's actually hindered blockchain's expansion is that it's very jargon filled. We talk about consensus and peers and nodes and things that most people have no idea what that means. And to make it work for the real world, we need a whole variety of, of people, of talents, of skills to make it real. Gotcha. We have a couple minutes left. If there's any questions in the room, feel free to throw your hand up. I got right in the middle was my first one, and I'll get down to you. Sir, what's your question? You. Right there. Um, <laughs> as a project developer, how do you sort the bad ideas from the good ideas? So I'll just rephrase it for folks who uh, may not have heard. As a project developer, how do you sort the good ideas from the bad ideas? It's a great question, um, and that's that's my day job every day. So first, I try and understand the idea. What is this person actually trying to achieve? Very often, people will give me a whole set of features. I want to do this, to do this, to do this. I'm like, what's the outcome? What problem are you trying to solve? And then I figure out. How many people are trying to solve that problem? Is it just Zach in the corner trying to solve that problem? Which, which is great, Zach. We, we want to help you with your problems. Um, but if this is an entire room, an entire industry, an entire country, that's a really big problem that IBM is probably going to be excited about solving. And then I think about, do we as IBM have permission? Do we have credibility to build and solve that problem? There are a lot of things that IBM is really good at. And it makes sense for us to solve problems where we can take those skills. There's other things where we're less good. And then do we have the right people to build that product and to sell it? And then I just have to figure out how to get them all to actually do that. That's probably, you could probably go at, at length about the actually doing <laughs> challenge and all uh, enterprise environments. There was a question down here, and then we'll go back up. Uh, we have two minutes left, so we'll do two, two last questions. Sir. So, so, when you have this consortium, So that's a lot of what we do at the early stages, and I could spend days talking about this topic. We are, we are, we are progressing on the technology level, but we have learned so much in governance. Who can join the network? Who can deploy a smart contract? How do you put an asset on that? How do you put an asset on that ledger? How do you verify that that asset is really what it is, especially if you're going from physical to digital? What happens when somebody leaves the, the network? Who owns the data? Who owns the IP? Um, I think we're working towards standards and models that start to work. I think we're starting to see large consortiums that work that have set out the governance. And then rather than other people starting things from scratch, they're just going to join those networks because it's much easier to join than to, than to build from scratch. Um, and I think there's 
there's a lot of lessons that we have about what works, what doesn't, but there's much, much more to do. And I think that more than anything else is why blockchain, especially in the enterprise space, has probably taken longer to evolve than many of us might have said three, four, five years ago. Yeah, great question on governance. That's really a, a pressing issue. Oh, follow up. Yeah, there's a lot of papers. I think what we're starting to see is in specific industries, we're seeing models. So I think trade finance has a couple of governance models. Um, we trade, which is a fabric-based project, Marco Polo, which is a R3 quarter-based project. They're starting to get to some standards around governance for those. Um, some currency supply chain, I think we're starting to see models. To go into the specifics would take far more time than we have here, but I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Last question, gentlemen up there with the microphone. Um, I know IBM's interested in uh, private blockchains. I wonder, uh, are you watching and what do you think about the future of the public blockchains? And in particular, how they might relate to the private blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. So there's kind of this like almost religious fervor in the blockchain world, right? You're either a public blockchain person and everything is about libertarianism, anarchy, take down the world, or people think you're private and it's all about kind of this closed country club model. Reality is in the gray in between. It depends on the scenario. There are certain situations where sure, it does make sense to have anonymous you know, parties that are transacting. But there are many where you want some level of permissioning. Like, for example, you can, anybody can walk into a public park as long as you don't start graffitiing people are going to let you stay there. Now, if you start to do graffiti or, or, or ruin the public park, the police are going to come and take you out. So that, that's one model of, of openness. The next is a bar, right? Anybody can go in a bar as long as you meet that threshold that you're 21, right? So there are criteria. And then there are very small closed. If you're in the Nuclear you know, Security Advisory Council, you have to be like, You've gone through security clearances. You've probably had every single person you ever know talk to in order to allow you into that room, right? And so we live in a world that needs all of those models. And we're going to be in a world where there are public blockchains that will connect to private blockchains, and you will be able to transfer assets into and out of, depending on what your needs are, depending on the use case. Um, I think we've started with private blockchains and I, I would use the, much less the word private and I would use permissioned because it means you had to provide some sort of credential to go in, whether that's good behavior or that's your nuclear security clearance. It just means that they know to some extent who you are or what criteria you meet. And there will be wide open public blockchains, there will be smaller private private ones or, or permissioned blockchains and they will connect and you'll be able to transfer across much the way the internet evolved, you know, over several decades, so. I think we'll leave it there. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. And, uh, this was fun. Next time, bring the fire. Yeah, it's a little chilly in here, so <laughs> next time I want to bring in the fire and actually do it right, fireside style. Well, join me in thanking Catherine, and uh, thanks for coming.